us in what I know will be an especially uh, provocative and engaging discussion. Uh, forgive me in advance for being a little uh, under the weather. My body is betraying me. Perhaps in a future semester we can talk about structures of self and versions of them at war. Um, but my energy may be a little lower um, today than usual. I want to say how excited I was not only to have the opportunity to work with Atre Enrico on this, but also to speak about goodness, um, at least initially. Um, what I realized in formulating my own thoughts, uh, in responding to the provocation of this opportunity, was just how much I give credence to the objections to poets outlined in the latter books of the Republic. Um, most of my own enthusiasms are for uh, texts that showcase compromising moral positions, <laughs> um, unmanly virtues, uh, elements of sorrow and anguish. I find that the textured resistance between circumstances that are less than flattering to the human creature and the substance of aesthetic response, which is for me predominantly joyful, uh, creates the most interesting counterpoint in uh, poems I teach, poems my students make, uh, and the poems I most enjoy reading. Donald Hall has observed that the history of poetry is not the history of happy texts, partly because pleasure multiplied by pleasure is boredom. Um, and I find that to be true. So I realized then that on a disciplinary level, um, my contact with goodness is not especially high. So I was inclined to turn to the experts. And of course, uh, this is our impetus, the organizing principle um, embedded in our time together this afternoon. Um, the three significant things uh, in education, according to uh, Mother Rosalie Hill, being beauty, goodness, and truth. Um, obviously, the organizing principle for these three long discussions, long conversations within the college, um, but goodness being our particular emphasis today. So I defer to her and pay homage. Um, but the specific experts I turn to most immediately were, of course, the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, which is my <laughs> I wanted to know what the hell is the good, after all, and forgive the formulation, compromising goodness as it does, uh, because my expressive enterprise, as I've said, usually um, marginalizes something that I could accept as fundamentally good. I began to think what it was, and I was delighted, firstly, to return to Marcus Aurelius, whose letters to himself, as the title I prefer, um, are also known as the Meditations, offered me a vantage. Rooted in telos, finally, in the satisfaction of ends. For whatever purpose each thing has been constituted, for that it has been constituted, and toward this it is carried. And its end is in that toward which it is carried, and where the end is, there also is the advantage and the good of each thing. I'll tell you that in no small way did it electrify me to turn again to the OED and recognize how comparable the structure of goodness is by definition there. The most general adjective of commendation implying the existence in a high or at least satisfactory degree of characteristic qualities which are either admirable in themselves or useful for some purpose. With my colleagues, we had agreed that the approach to the task of elucidating goodness today would be rooted in this delicious um, quotation of Samuel Johnson's, that the only end of writing is to enable the readers better to enjoy life or better to endure it. But here I found, in fact, great compatibility with the elements outlined in both of these quotations. And so I decided to approach um, my contribution to this afternoon's panel by organizing qualities of literary experience around those two poles, things which are enjoyable about textual experience and things which may in fact be useful or contribute to our endurance, the degree to which we can survive the world. In Johnson's quote, of course, is some element of the standard Horatian attitude that a, a poem should be sweet and useful, or at least those who tend to win arguments are both of those things. Um, this is a lengthy quotation. I hope you can excuse me. I think it makes something of a controversial point, but one I realized I take absolutely for granted in the context of my own pedagogy and indeed in my own life. Not long ago, I had a conversation with my students of the Alcala Review, and we were considering an essay recently published in the New York Times Magazine called The Morality Wars, which questioned whether we occupy now a post-textual era a point after pure aesthetic engagement, a point where social concerns and the identities of people who are making text 
are as central to our considerations of their value and contributions um, as the text themselves. This was a provocative discussion. I realized in its course that I still uphold a certain element of art for art's sake hopefulness in my courses. Um, I was provoked to consider ways by which I might ameliorate that in time's future. But in the meantime, I can say I agree with Marcus Aurelius in terms of my standard classroom comportment and my private exercise uh, of literature that everything which is in any way beautiful is beautiful in itself and terminates in itself, not having praise as part of itself. Neither worse nor better is a thing made by being praised. That which is really beautiful has no need of anything, not more than law, not more than truth, not more than benevolence or modesty. Which of these things is beautiful because it is praised or spoiled by being blamed? Is such a thing as an emerald made worse than it was if it is not praised? Or gold, ivory, purple, a lyre, a little knife, a flower, a shrub? What a beautiful matrix of incongruously connected objects here. But the fundamental argument, I think, is that the reward is in the material nature of those things themselves. When I'm teaching, I absolutely encourage my students to imagine that there is an implicit telos in the premise of the text they are composing. That is to say, there are expectations embedded in the object itself, and it's our task to iron those out or discover them and then structure them in discernible ways. That is to say that the first line of a sonnet makes a promise both to the poem and to the reader that the poem will unfold in a logical or discernible way, no, no matter how disorderly it may seem. So what are the elements of textuality that are gold, ivory, purple, lyre, a little knife? I know that may be the most challenging of these to find beautiful elsewhere. It's a dagger, but I prefer a little knife. Um, uh, a flower or a shrub, also better than a bush, as it's translated elsewhere. So I was imagining that really there are three fundamental contributions that a literary text makes in and of itself, internal to itself, without regard for the external world. That is to say, um, things, to return, that are admirable in themselves, per that definition, per Johnson. Things that help us to enjoy life. That enjoyment being rooted in the material specificity of literary textuality. I fear that as I organize this, you guys will not find much that I will say to be especially controversial, um, but I'm interested in highlighting elements of them nevertheless. The first and maybe most obvious thing that we hope for in a literary text, one of the means by which it offers us companionship, is actually in providing respite from the world. That's a means of enjoyment, I think, is to be alleviated of the burdens and textured uh, agonies, <laughs> not to sound too dark about the nature of life itself, um, but I am, after all, being betrayed by my own body on this very day. <laughs> if I read Wallace Stevens, I'm provided with a vantage, an experience, a texture, an enclosure that is otherwise unavailable to me. It may not in itself be restorative, it may not be healing, but it is an opportunity for pause, for entry into a space unlike the space into which I was made. The palm at the end of the mind, beyond the last thought, rises in the bronze decor. A gold-feathered bird sings in the palm, without human meaning, without human feeling, a foreign song. You know then that it is not the reason that makes us happy or unhappy. The bird sings, its feathers shine, the palm stands on the edge of space. The wind moves slowly in the branches. The bird's fire-fangled feathers dangle down. I think Stevens is making a case for the inherent virtue of aesthetic experience, again, independent of reason. It's not the reason that makes us happy or unhappy, the poem seems to propose, but rather the opportunity to consider and behold the poem at the end of the mind, beyond the last thought, beyond reason, in the suspension of human experience made possible by the engulfing or encompassing experience of aesthetic life. I'll say beyond um, the imagination, beyond respite, um, we can say uh, the prospect of creation itself, the opportunity to engage in an experience of ex nihilo generation situates us, as Coleridge argued, in the position of the divine. It gives us an opportunity to be progenitors whether we happen to receive ideas um, from the pen of someone else 
or make them ourselves. I think shapeliness is another contribution. This is sometimes described as form. I thought about characterizing it as structure in the course of this experience, but to reward our pattern-seeking selves. This is a pretty conventional poem, but if any of you was feeling good about yourselves today, I want to say it was written by Alexander Pope at the age of 12. Um, so deal with that. Um, <laughs> The major charisma of this text, in my view, is not really the sentiment expressed, because it is kind of a conventional pastoral attitude, but it's formal qualities. It rewards our experience of temporal organization by unfolding and manipulating time. These are three lines of pentameter above one dimeter line. That is to say there are four musical beats, four accents per line in the first three lines of each quatrain, and then a two beat line. So I'll say the first one aloud, and I think you can feel structure. Happy the man whose wish and care a few paternal acres bound, content to breathe his native air in his own ground. That is what, I, what I've tapped out here is a silent accent. Metris and prosodists are preoccupied by this, how a poem can make rhythm without contributing anything further on the linguistic level. But you all felt it, I presume. That surprising state of suspension and expectation and even gratification of rhythmic um, uh, what, anticipation there. It is a kind of reward. I could be saying Baba Black Sheep to these lines, not verbatim because uh, the metrical structure is divergent, but one of my favorite things to teach in my intermediate class is the Jabberwocky, whose primary reward is structure. The first stanza of the Jabberwocky is borderline nonsense, but when it returns at poem's end, it is a different series of sounds. Though they are verbatim, it demonstrates the journey we have taken. That's rooted simply in structure. Yeah, we can analyze this poem and be rewarded for our attention to its details. We can think about what silence in this context may be, but on a physical, sensual level, we are rewarded simply by our engagement with a structure, with structured time, with structured sound, with shapeliness, with the recurrence of sound and rhyme. That is a glory in itself. I mean, this is a body of text, but it responds or anticipates or invites our embodied response to it. And that is one of the unique pleasures of literary textuality. I don't say that it's unique to literature, but it's definitive of literature. And it is, I would say, a reward in itself, unto itself. It doesn't reach outside of the textual sphere. It embeds us within it. And finally, I would say, um, Stylization. This is a catch-all, really, for me. I believe that poetry is a matter of stylization. Mallarmé claims that at any point at which you encounter a straining after style, you have poetry. I find that a persuasive case. Um, so naturally, this is a text that deals with rhythm, but it also presents us with unconventional organizations of sound, concentrations of metaphorical operation. Many of the verbs in this text are metaphors in themselves. They're pretty sly. It's not an extended metaphor exactly. Um, but we can see disruptions in syntax, um, the potential, the frustration, the glorious frustration of slant rhyme. And if you do not like lines two and three, excuse me, lines three and four of the second stanza, I don't think we can be friends. <laughs> how the old mountains drip with sunset, how the hemlocks burn. How the dun brake is draped in cinder by the wizard sun. How the old steeples hand the scarlet till the ball is full. Have I the lip of the flamingo that I dare to tell? Then how the fire ebbs like billows touching all the grass with a departing sapphire feature as a duchess passed. There's a high concentration of forms of deviation from utilitarian linguistic pursuits. And that's really what I define as poetry. Anytime we're using language for another end, then it's immediate utility, it's immediate usefulness. We're engaged in an act of poetry. Dickinson's doing quite a bit there, but I hope you can be pleased as I am always to encounter the lip of the flamingo, um, which is not merely a manifestation of imaginative act, but also an opportunity to disrupt um, the otherwise seemingly consistent sunset drenched textuality. It's a very weird idea, though I guess the lip of the flamingo itself would be pink or red, so the palette is in there. Um, but really, it's just an opportunity to consider a thing that doesn't exist. I don't, I don't think flamingos have lips, after all. 
um, just those strange but beaks. Um, but this provides us with another example of a way that a poem enables us to enjoy life by presenting us with things that are in some way gratuitous to it, things that are not mandated by the world but given to it through literary actuality. They transfix us. Actually, I think poetry is one of the few ways we can experience eternity which is by reaching through our own experience into the suspended state of attention that deprives us, if we regard it as a deprivation, of our sense of identity, location, the time of day, the deadlines that are emergent in our immediate sphere. We're suspended in a space of total protection from ourselves. That's magnificent. I think that's what it must feel like to be a god. It's hypothetical, of course. So what are some things that poetry does to help us endure life, per Johnson? These are the elements of poetry that are useful for some purpose. Matthew Arnold uh, was so terribly embarrassed by Keats's letters that he wrote an entire introduction to a Keatsian volume trying to find um, evidence of his character and his moral integrity in other spaces of his life and work. Um, he just thought his love letters were shamefully jejun and impassioned. Uh, this is really kind of a platonic objection to a poet. He's not, not uh, brave enough, not strong enough, not enjoining us to perform um, righteous uh, actions in the course of our own lives. And he makes this provocative claim that poetry is, at bottom, this is in his essay on Wordsworth, as you can see, a criticism of life. The greatness of a poet lies in her powerful and beautiful application of ideas to life, to the question, how to live. The poet deals with life because she deals with that which really exists. Of course, the first three components I've presented to you so far are not about that which really exists, but about making new things up about escaping that which really exists. So if poetry is good because it provides us with opportunities for respite, um, on the one end, according to Johnson, to help us enjoy life, it may also be good because it helps us to endure it, to deal with that which really exists. How is it useful at any time would be an interesting question, one that I do try to um, alleviate my students of worrying too much about, though I think the uh, usefulness of poetry is evident in both of these halves, if we say. The first is perception. Poetry reifies perception. It provides us with objects of perception that multiply our own perception in turn. And that way it makes us more attentive to the world. It creates of each of us a plurality. That's an exceptional contribution to my operations in daily life. It means that I can see a tree in 16 or 18 ways. It means that I can expand my sense of truthfulness and goodness to other human forms, other human spaces, other forms of articulation by adding to my own limited store of perceptions. That's pretty impressive. And I think that's the fundamental humanitarian contribution of a poem, is that it multiplies our sensitivity to other means of being human, other forms of humanness, other perceptions. The primary pleasure of this text, Keats's Two Autumn, which is often cited as the most mellifluous, delicious, maybe even the single best lyric poem in the history of our tongue, is perception. It's not rich with metaphor per se. It's not rich with argumentation. It's really a celebration of plenitude, of being grateful for that which is, and its adequacy in itself. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more, later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. It's magnificent, isn't it? Really, it just makes me delighted to think about a swollen gourd, plump hazel shells. I see them in a way I would never see them by walking into Whole Foods, for example. <laughs> but I walk the earth in the aftermath of this <clears throat> poem, being emboldened to perceive them, to retain this perception, to add it to my own limited perception. And that's phenomenal. 
the fact that poetry reifies perception enhances our array of perceptions, and that is, I think, a fundamental good. Of course, poems also help us to interpret the world, not to escape from it, but to enter it. I've long believed that po poets and poems really can be organized, um, I don't want to oversimplify, but you can kind of bifurcate them in one of two ways. There are poets for whom the imagination enters the world, and there are poems for whom the world enters the imagination. I would say that Wallace Stevens is a case of the latter. The world shows up only in his imaginative space. But Keats allows his imagination to enter the world, to animate it, to show the world to us in greater color. Other poets approach that project in different ways. As you probably know, Shelley has argued that poetry marks the before unapprehended relations of things and perpetuates their apprehension. That's one of the ways, from Shelley's perspective, a poem is a political document because it helps to refresh language, create accuracy of perception, and multiply justice as a result. Philip Larkin is not subscribing to that specific project. In fact, he's helping us to feel more sad, I think. Um, but as I said at the beginning of the presentation, nothing can please me more than to have a textured sorrow rooted in the pleasures of a poem, the rich um, mouth full of this text. The trees are coming into leaf like something almost being said. The recent buds relax and spread. Their greenness is a kind of grief. He wonders later if it's just because they grow old and die too, if that's what's sad about them. No, it isn't that really. It's that they have an opportunity to renew. I would have included the whole text, but I've already read to you so much this afternoon. I figured some of you would be conked out. So I'm glad that isn't the case. But we can see Larkin making a case for the nature of the world, for contextualizing organic life um, and the life of trees specifically in a way that makes them sensible to us so that I might not cut it down, I might not regard it as a foreign entity, but as something with which I share the scope of organic life. That's pretty great. I'm happy for Larkin to run around interpreting the world and empowering me to be a respondent to wider and wider forms of interpretation. And I would say that's different from perception as such. It's a kind of um, analysis. Poetry analyzes the world and presents the products of that analysis to us, and that helps me too. And finally, overt instruction, moral instruction. I think we have to include, I hope this is not a controversial thing to say, it may be. Certain books uh, uh, of a religious nature fall under this warehouse as well, which are so rich with lyricism, um, narrative uh, dynamism, and an investment in us as human beings to help us to treat each other more well. I think that is also a fundamental good. This comes from one of my favorite poems of W.H. Auden's, a very weird and surreal text. This language actually comes from some clocks, it seems. It's kind of an unspecified voice, but the clocks are whirring and chiming, and then suddenly um, an omniscient speaker enters the fray. It's a little bit later, but the poem enjoins us to respond to its instruction, so I would say, or at least it offers us some implicit instruction. Oh, look, look in the mirror. Oh, look in your distress. Life remains a blessing although you cannot bless. Stand, stand at the window as the tears scald and start. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. I've never hugged more neighbors than after reading this poem, I will tell you. Um, it took this to embed the golden rule in my memory um, to create a mnemonic structure for instruction, for um, a, 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 an invitation to higher conduct. Um, so of course, poems instruct us in the ways of human space as well. So this helps me to endure most definitely because none of you are running up here to stab me or steal my wallet, thankfully. Um, but I would say that's really uh, the totality of what I will offer to you today before clearing space for my colleagues who also organize their thoughts around the same Samuel Johnson quotation. So maybe what I will do is bend back uh, to this issue of approach. Um, I hope that some of the texts I've presented will bear on these presentations in your mind, um, but I will uh, clear some space and thank again both of my colleagues for joining me today, but I'll invite firstly Atrey Foucault to come and speak to you, so thank you. I um, want to thank Maliki so much for this opportunity to um, share this space with you and with Rico. Um, and also Brian Clack, Lindy Via, and everyone working in the Humanities Center, Sa uh, Sarah, for um, sustaining these kinds of conversations um, on campus. It's really changed um, things for us. <laughs>
Um, Syme as well, responding to Samuel Johnson's assertion, um, this one. Um, my presentation is going to be on the goodness of colonial languages in the production of post and anti-colonial writing, exactly as Johnson advises, a type of persistence described by the Jamaican poet Olive Senor as being like the addictive yearning for grain cracked open on the tongue. <coughs> to understand why one would yearn for eruptions on the tongue is to appreciate that today's post-colonial nations and cultures thrive in the afterglow or aftermath of the poem, as you said, of one's colonial languages, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch. And this, despite the fact that their persistence has led directly to the erasure of native indigenous languages, especially amongst the younger generations in these locations. So in India, for instance, the wholesale adoration of its resident and diasporic Anglophone writers who only write in English has led to the rejection of literature written in India's other 22 main languages and 720 regional languages. And these two, when read or published for the curriculum, are most often translated into English, India's second official language. As seen in this way, goodness is a type of yearning in the afterglow that translates into the type of stamina needed to withstand what Martinican writer Franz Fanon describes as the phenomenon of God gone astray in the flesh. In the Negro in language, the first chapter of his hugely influential 1957 book, Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon explains that the phenomenon of language for the colored man is, I quote, inherently connected to his compre comprehension of the dimension of the other. For it is implicit that to speak is to exist absolutely for the other. No one would dream of doubting that language's major arteries fed from the heart of those various theories that tried to prove that the Negro is a stage in the slow evolution of monkey into man. And for him to speak means to be in a position to use a certain syntax to grasp the morphology of this or that language, but it means above all to assume a culture and to support the weight of that culture. The Negro of the Antilles will be proportionately white that is, he will come closer to being a real human being in direct ratio to his mastery of the French language, end quote. To press home his point of language as implosion and eruption, Fanon ends the chapter by quoting from Sartre's 1948 Orfeo Noir, Black Orpheus. Referring to the mastery of French by colonized populations, Sartre asks, what then did you expect when you unbound the gag that had muted those black mouths, that they would chant your praises? Here are black men standing looking at us, and I hope that you, like me, will feel the shock of being seen. For 3,000 years, the white man has enjoyed the privilege of seeing without being seen. The white man, <coughs> white because he was white, white like daylight, white like truth, lighted up the creation like a torch. But today these black men are looking at us and our gaze comes back to our own eyes. As we see in this communion between a Parisian and Martinican, language in the post-colonial context becomes simultaneously that with which the once colonized yearns for their rehumanization and that which produces for the once colonial the shock of being seen in the afterglow. Once colonial languages, in other words, excuse me, um, can no longer be solely in the service of empire. Two singular literary inventions exemplify the contradictory nature of this kind of goodness. Um, what I suggest is a yearning in the afterglow. <coughs> contradictory in post-colonial literary expression precisely because a relationship with colonizing and colonized forces must be retained. My first example is from the Jamaican writer Michelle Cliff and her notion of ruination the second from Nigerian writer and envi environmental activist Ken Sarawiwa and his project in Rotten English. And lastly, a short segment from William Kentridge, um, one of South Africa's most innovative living authors, excuse me, artists, um, whose works often play with notions of language as sound or sound as language. In her essay, Caliban's Daughter, Cliff delineates her purpose specifically as a writer of Afro-Caribbean experience and heritage who grew up with a Western experience and education. This paradigm-shifting essay, published in 2003, was in honor of the white Creole Dominican author Jean Rhys, whose 1966 novel White Sargasso Sea imploded the British literary canon 
through its first person narrative from the perspective of Bertha, uh, who, whom Jean Rhys renames Antoinette, the deranged Caribbean madwoman in the attic, standing between Jane Eyre and her beloved Mitch Mr. Rochester in Charlotte Bronte's novel. <laughs> it's also the essay in which Cliff articulates the importance of seeing language through an eco-feminist lens specific to the Caribbean landscape. In Cliff's analogy, the Jamaican terms ruinate and ruination, both words signifying the reclamation of speech by those who choose to be wild, evoke the reclamation of soil and land by the uncontrolled, uncontrollable chaotic forest, previously strangled under the architectural pressures of empire's buildings. As she says, the Jamaican invention ruination contains both the word ruin and nation. So a language in ruination means one in which the imposed nation is overcome by the naturalness of ruin. Similarly, as individuals in this landscape, she <coughs> argues, we, the colonized, are also subject to ruination, ourselves reverting to the wildness of the forest. In this way, she describes her writing as the invention of a peculiar speech to best capture her peculiar self, sometimes civilized, sometimes ruinate, both Caliban and Ario, that is, enslaved in spirit and flesh, and underneath it all, the granddaughter of Sycorax, pre-colonial female, pre-colonial island. She uses ruinate to outline the paradoxical state of silence and voicelessness for children such as herself chosen to represent the colonizer's world. And by identifying as Caliban's daughter, she is the wild child unable to speak in a tongue she does not own. To speak in ruination may seem to come with limitations because the legacies of empire implode from within the speaking self. Literary representations of the Caribbean from England Shakespeare's Tempest, Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Bronte's Jane Eyre, to name a select few, for instance, are the most consistently recycled tropes in post-colonial literature by Caribbean writers, even today. But as Ken Sarawiwa, my second example, shows, it is not the content so much as the form that can finally tell a new story. There is no need to distinguish between a master trope and its echoes. Language becomes the principal character, and to view it as chaos reminds us of its fundamental uh, adaptability, language as forest. Sarah Wee was 1994 novel, So is a Boy, uh, which is Soldier Boy, was undertaken as a challenge uh, to publishers' notions of what an African novel should look like, a style critics have since described as both the characters and authors uninhibited gamble with language. As Sarah Weaver explains, rotten ling English is a language, even if disordered and disorderly. It is a language born of mediocre education and severely limited opportunities, but it borrows words, patterns, and images freely from the mother tongue and finds expression in, in a limited English vocabulary. <coughs> to its speakers, it has the advantage of having no rules and no syntax. It thrives on lawlessness and is firmly a part of the dislocated and discordant society in which Sosa Boy must live. Sosa Boy situates rotten English, a mixture of Nigerian pidgin English, broken English, and occasional flashes of good, even idiomatic English within the context of civil war, an apt metaphor for the uh, authors working through the relationship between colonial language and its neo-colonizing role in state warfare. It also privileges Sosa Boy's speech, amplifying the perspective of a barely educated primary school boy, exulting in the new world he is discovering at the same time as he's beginning to know his place in the world as a soldier barely in his early teens. In the first chapter, Sosa Boy describes his hometown relating in his childlike innocence the beginning of a new world of a new order that is in reality the Biafran Civil War or the Nigerian Civil War of the late 1960s. But he understands it as the encroachment of a new language he calls grammar and vocabulary. In his words, people were not happy to hear that there is trouble everywhere. Radio begin they holla as you never holla before. Big, big grammar, long, long words, every time, before, before, the grammar was not plenty and everybody was happy. 
But now grammar began to plenty, and, every, and people were not happy. As grammar plenty, trouble plenty. We people cannot understand plenty what was happening. As Sozoboy moves away to enter the civil war, not understanding what the new word Nigeria means, not understanding why his enemy looks and speaks just like him, he begins to learn the big, big grammar and words, but his homeland in the meantime has vanished irretrievably. Um, Sozoboy incidentally was published just before Ken Sarawiwa himself was assassinated by the state in 1955. Um, he was hugely involved <coughs> for the Ogoni people, he is Ogoni himself, um, in their indigenous rights movements against Dutch Shell Oil's uh, activities in their homeland in the Niger Delta. Um, I wanted to end with um, an example of what I thought Cliff's wild uncontrollability or Sarawiwa's disorderly lawlessness could sound or look like in art. Um, and there is a, a South African artist whom I love, William Kentridge, who just finished his exhibition at the Tate um, and has moved to New York, so if any of you are going to be in New York soon. Um, but I'm not sure how to switch to the, oh, actually to the video, please. Um, so I'm just going to, um, just briefly, it's from his new work called Head and Load, which is from a Ghanaian um, proverb that goes, the head and the load are troubles to the neck. Um, it's an homage to the forgotten African soldiers of World War II, um, and we're just going to watch a one-minute clip. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Oh, if you could start from the beginning, this is the end. Yeah, exactly, yeah, thanks. This work is really huge, and um, like I said, he plays with language as sound, and sound as language, so cacophony is a part of the, um, it's a huge presence on the stage. Um, and he um, also uses a lot of shadows. Um, but Head and Load is a uh, multimedia installation, um, and it uh, mixes dance, music, opera, sounds, and um, mostly shadows, as I said. Um, actors sing and speak, um, as I'm sure you heard, in English, French, German, Zulu, Sosha, Swazi, Swahili. Um, but most importantly, they use a lot of high-speed nonsense verse um, as a way to dramatize the breakdown of language 
as people in Africa try to rebuild their post-colonial societies, um, to suggest that breakdown is a part of post-colonial expression, but to define this as art and as being the afterglow of past oppressions. So thank you very much. Um, I'll admit, when I was asked by Maliki first to be a part of this panel, I was um, both excited and filled with a little bit of trepidation, um, being that I'm not the uh, literature specialist on the panel. Um, I did do an English major in undergrad, but, um, but the, I think the key way in which I connect is that in my Problem of God class, and also in my dissertation, I engage heavily with uh, Dostoevsky's novels, and then also with the films of Terence Malick. And what I'm going to be talking about uh, here today are some of the ideas of goodness that uh, Dostoevsky deals with in the, his novels, last two novels, The Idiot and The Brothers Karamazov, as well as Terence Malick, who's maybe not as familiar to everyone in the room, Dostoevsky, at least most people have heard his name and know he wrote a novel called Crime and Punishment or something like that. But uh, Malick um, was a philosopher who realized academia was not really his bag after all and then turned filmmaker. And his films are particularly um, intertextual with major literary texts, theological texts, philosophical texts. So part of the thing I'm going to be looking at here or drawing out is how he engages Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, Catholic writers like Thomas Akempis and Augustine and uh, even world, uh, the poet William Wordsworth. Um, but my trepidation, by the way, was eased when Malachy told me we were going to be uh, organizing this around the Johnson quote, the only end of writing is to enable the readers better to enjoy life or better to endure it, because that mirrors uh, precisely my approach to, to the engagement with literature and film in my work. I'm going to add two, two quotes to that that I think um, uh, help, um, how should I put it, flesh out further um, what might be at stake in the Johnson quote. The first one is from Friedrich Nietzsche and his text, The Use and Abuse of History. And when he's talking about history here, um, I think it's worth noting that for Nietzsche, as for a later Nietzschean-influenced uh, literary theorist like Hayden White, um, history is itself a form of literature. I don't know some historians in the room might be irritated by that statement. But um, nevertheless, White and Nietzsche's point is that in the end, history and literature are not identical. But the main difference is that history has to take its plot points, not just from imagination, but from things that have actually occur occurred. But in the end, the task of the historian is to create a narrative, to create a story that out of these otherwise just chaotic plot points in the data of history. But Nietzsche's quote here, um, following uh, the poet Goethe, um, the, he opens this text saying, moreover, I hate everything that merely instructs me without increasing or directly quickening my activity. That is the quote of Goethe that, that Nietzsche starts with. And he says, these words of Goethe may well stand at the head of my thoughts on the worth and worthlessness of history. I will show in them why instruction that does not quicken, knowledge that slackens the reign of activity, why in fact history in Goethe's phrase must be seriously hated as a costly and superfluous luxury of the understanding for we are still in want of the necessaries of life, and the superfluous is an enemy to the necessary. And Nietzsche goes on to say, we do need history, but quite differently from the jaded idlers in the garden of knowledge. I would say, too often, we in academia are guilty of becoming those jaded idlers in the garden of knowledge. We do need history, but quite differently from the jaded idlers in the garden of knowledge, however grandly they may look down on our rude and unpicturesque requirements. In other words, we need it for life and action, not as a convenient way to avoid life and action or to excuse, our, uh, excuse in ourselves a selfish life 
and a cowardly or base action. This is what I find running throughout Dostoevsky and running throughout Terence Malick is narrative that does not, while it presents us the good and the beautiful, it does not prevent it, present it to us as something that just becomes a palliative or an escape or something in which we can excuse ourselves for a selfish life or cowardly or base actions. Another cue that I take, um, or another quote that I love on this regard is from the poet A.E. Hausman. He says, a good poem should affect someone like a shiver down the spine. And this would, the second part will definitely connect with um, both talks preceding me. A shiver down the spine or a punch in the stomach. Meaning either if it's a good, true work of literature, in his case, Hausman was spe specifically addressing poems, but it should either inspire like the shiver down the spine, or it should really affect you with that slug in the stomach that shakes up your world in the way that you look at things. So, Malik and Dostoevsky both just relentlessly do this. Um, every time they present you with goodness, they do not allow you the comfort that those who love beauty and goodness will be happy, will be rewarded, will have a good final outcome, will even achieve anything that is measurable in a utilitarian uh, sort of way. I think here in particular of in The Idiot, um, it's always funny to talk about novels and like not want to spoiler the ending, but you know, when they've been around for a hundred years, I don't know what, okay, but, uh, <laughs> But I say that because um, the idiot, the title is referring to the, the main character, Prince Mishkin, who is himself Dostoevsky's thought experiment in what would it look like if Jesus came back today? Like what would happen right, if you had a beautiful soul like Jesus? And Many people call the, idiot, the ending of The Idiot one of the most devastating endings in all of uh, world literature because what happens to Mishkin? What happens to this Christ figure that is there in the contemporary world? Well, he's, the title tells you. He's perceived as an idiot, as a fool, as someone whose ideas and so forth are completely impractical, that his self, un, selfless and... Um, and self-sacrificial love is just the concept of a complete moron in this world that cannot get anything done. And of course, what you would want, I think, if, especially since many of us are inclined to agree with Dostoevsky that Mishkin and his Christ-like ways are, are in some ways in line with what we conceive of the good or fully in line with what we conceive of the good, depending on our perspectives. Um, one would hope there's some sort of redemptive affirmative ending on a story like that. But there isn't. Literally nothing that Mishkin tried to fix in the world gets fixed. And he ends up with a fate ar arguably worse than death, back in a straitjacket in a, in a mental asylum and all of his work and efforts and everything having gone for nothing. I mean, you talk about a novel that just ends with the brutal punch in the stomach. It's, it's, uh, there's things that will equal the idiot, but few that will surpass it. Um, and in the Brothers Karamazov, you have his hero Alyosha, who is also um, supposed to be this very, like the closest thing to an image of Christ in the, in the contemporary world. And Alyosha's viewpoint is a beautiful one, and also one that is called idiotic and naive by his brother Ivan, by um, so many of the people that he interacts with, his own father and so forth. And again, and in the beginning of that one, Dostoevsky in the preface specifically speaks about Alyosha as the hero of the story, which again kind of sets you up to some ex expectations of some grand um, redemptive arc. 
this one doesn't end quite like the idiot does, but you don't get what you are hoping for. Um, in the Brothers Karamazov, rather what you get is this in demonstration of this quote right in the center of the story in which um, the elder Zosima advises uh, Alyosha, Zosima is Alyosha's um, spiritual father, his, um, his guru, so to speak. But he sends him out of the monastery and promises him this. Because of his good heart, he promises him this. In this world, you will have intense suffering. But you will bless life and teach others to bless life. And what you get in the story there is he's not able to save his brother who's wrongly convicted of murder. He's not able to save his other brother who's slowly descending into madness. But he is able to finally connect with some young 12-year-old boys and stop them from descending into like total nihilism and hatred of life. That is the bit. That is the little glimmer of a takeaway that you get. But for Dostoevsky, that's the key. That's what matters. And this is what I think like, ties back also to what Malachi was saying at the beginning, that that which is truly good doesn't even need praise. It does not need some utilitarian outcome. It is beautiful and sufficient in and of itself. So switching over to um, the films of Terrence Malick. Um, I will just, actually I'll just talk about um, one of his films then on this point. Um, the Thin Red Line is set in World War II and in a lot of our minds, right, we've been kind of conditioned to think now in like retrospect that World War II is the good war or the just war. If there was ever a just war, if there's ever a war that could fit with Augustine's um, understanding of like a good or just war, it would be World War II. Um, the Thin Red Line subverts those expectations or presuppositions we have. Um, and the main character in it, played by Jim Caviezel, um, spends more or less the entire movie trying to figure out if there's anything worth actually dying for which also makes him realize, is there anything actually worth living for? So um, at this point, can we cue up the, the first clip from the film? This is him, the main character, remembering his, um, his mother's death and the, how it affected him. Everyone hear it? No. No, let's let get more volume up. Is there oh. volume over there? Oh, sorry. Oh. Ah, can we restart it? <laughs> Thanks. I remember my mother when she was dying. I asked her if she was afraid. She just shook her head. I was afraid to touch the death I seen in her. I couldn't find nothing beautiful or uplifting about her going back to God. I heard people talk about immortality, but I ain't seen it. 
be like to know that this breath now was the last one you was ever going to draw. I just hope I can meet it the same way she did, with the same calm. Because that's where it's hidden, the immortality I hadn't seen. Not quite yet, I'm sorry. Um, so in that scene, he's, he's AWOL um, at that point, um, not having any reason, not seeing any reason why he should fight and die for anything else. Yet he's also plagued by this memory of his mother's death and this, this goodness he saw in the way she faced, this purity that in the way she faced her death and is himself ruminating, can I, is it possible that I become that same kind of person? Right. And as the rest of the film um, goes, here are some of the things he grapples with. At one point, he's looking at a Japanese soldier dead and half submerged in the dirt, and he hears the Japanese soldier speaking to him, saying to him, are you righteous? Are you kind? Does your confidence lie in this? Are you loved by all? Know that I was too. Do you imagine your sufferings will be less because you love goodness and truth? There comes that punch in the stomach again right there, right? Like there he's pursuing he's trying to become more of this person loving goodness and truth and trying to meet like death like his mother and what he's realizing is that the more you actually genuinely love and wish to be good the more you will necessarily also experience great suffering in life because to love things means to be vulnerable to be to pursue the good means to be vulnerable to greater disappointment and loss which is itself an Augustinian point. Right? Saint, Saint Augustine talks extensively about how loving things makes, is intrinsically tied to greater suffering. And thus in the center of the film, when a great battle is happening, there's like an actual like, fra uh, passage cribbed from Augustine in there where he says, this great evil, where does it come from? How did it steal into the world? What seat, what root did it grow from? Who's doing this? Who's killing us? robbing us of life and light, mocking us with the sight we might have known. Does our ruin benefit the earth? Does it help the grass to grow, the sun to shine? Is this darkness in you too? Have you passed through this night? But he ultimately concludes that despite this unanswered question to human suffering and evil, says, and this is borrowed from Wordsworth, he concludes, darkness and light, strife and love. Are they the workings of one mind, the features of the same face? And then he, as a prayer, says, look out through my eyes, look out at the things you have made, all things shining. And in that quote, you see this decision to come to fully embrace all of life, goodness and the suffering that is bound up with it which is itself embodied by the same character in his death scene. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so. <coughs> One last question. Take questions. <laughs>
前はお前を殺したくない So as a final comment, I'll contextualize what just happened there, which is that he has run out to draw the uh, Japanese soldiers away from his unit. And as you probably could see, he, oops, as in, <laughs> embodied in that final scene, he finds that space of calm and of resolve, not knowing that his sac whether his sacrifice will help anyone, but also committed, you, know, you see the passive way he raises his rifle there at the end, committed that he's not going to take a life of the enemy that he has now come to see as no enemy of his, but also that the gunfire directed at him will tip off his, his friends and, and comrades to be able to escape. But he does it simply because, simply because he sees it as the beautiful, good, and right thing to do with no assurances that it will work. No assurances that his, him or his other friend's suffering will be less. And thank you. It wasn't, but you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think the most dialogue one finds in his films uh, is, is, in, um, is in his first one, Badlands. But they, the, the rest of his films are actually quite sparse. And what I find particularly interesting in my like, kind of uh, interaction, research, um, presentations, publications, whatnot, with, it, with his work, and track is tracking down, because almost every time there is language, and this is what's really kind of ironic about some of the haters, uh, the Malik haters in the film, like, critic world, is they often talk about how the voiceovers are like banal platitudes, without realizing that almost exclusively they are quotes of Steinbeck, Dostoevsky, Thomas Akempis, uh, Kierkegaard, uh, you know, on and on. The list just goes on and on. And yet they'll be calling because they don't like his like filmmaking style or something like that. Like that these are banal platitudes when they haven't done the work to see that he repeatedly draws off of major philosophical and literary and theological figures for the language of goodness that he does put in the right, like into the wonder which you referenced. One of the few kind of like cohesive blocks of, of language is the St. Patrick prayer, 
when Javier Bardem is like looking at the world and like trying to like see his path forward. But um, but the other thing that I would say that um, you know emphasizing the language element. The other thing I really appreciate in Malik that I've noticed from the way he adapts these quotes from the major philosophical and literary figures is that he, and theological figures is that he usually takes what is a declarative statement in them and reworks it as a question. So that what is a, is a definitive solution for those figures is something that points in the way, but is not, it's left open-ended with Malik. So like the Wordsworth quote, uh, I was just talking about darkness and light, strife and love. In, in Wordsworth, it's a declarative statement. Malik reworks it to as, are they the workings of the same mind? In Tree of Life, when he engages with, with Kierkegaard, and does, he, he, does, he does the same moves. And I find that way of changing the language of goodness to be relentless questioning, I think there's something rather interesting there as well.